Hello, this is Kerry Schutz from MathWorks. This is part three in my uh, PLL modeling series using mixed signal block set. Uh, in, in part one, uh, just for a brief review, um, we pulled in the integer in PLL with single modulus prescaler block. That's basically what I'm calling a monolithic PLL block. We configured it. Uh, we configured it to have a divide by 70 um the factor we had a 30 megahertz reference therefore we had a 2.1 gigahertz output and we just observed how it behaved at different nodes like the charge pump up down output the loop filter output and the vco output and then we used this feature called the edit system a uh, button to break uh the model apart such that we could see underneath it and make modifications so at first we only had the mask if i pull that block in again at first all we had was the mass that we didn't see the underneath, and then we hit edit system, and then we could see all of these constituent subsystems, the charge pump, the VCL, the prescaler loop filter. And that's what we see down here in the lower left. From that point, uh, in, the, in the next video then, we, uh, instead of starting from the monolithic block and going down via the edit system, we started with these constituent building blocks like the charge pump, VCO loop filter, and we built up the PLL from those. Uh, we ran the model, same settings, got the same, you know, effective results, okay, as we would expect. And then we got into a little bit of charge pump and impairment modeling. So we went into the charge pump and we uh, modified things like uh, current impairments, and then we saw what impact that had on the output. In fact, I've got that over here on the screen. We saw we ended up with some type of steady state uh, impairment. Uh, we, you know, everything looks fine here from 25,000 feet, but if we zoom in, on the let's say the steady state portion of the loop filter the pll output we start to see that it's not truly perfect we've got some uh, about 15 or 14 15 microvolts of peak to peak variation that would result in you know some type of spurious output in the frequency domain in that case at the reference frequency offset so that's what we were doing in the first uh, few videos of the series. Now, in this video, what I want to get into is more on impairment modeling. And what I didn't show the previous time around was how we could see underneath the hood of these blocks. These blocks themselves do not come with an edit system button to, uh, shall we say, break the link to the library and go underneath and see the block. But we can still go underneath and we can do that via looking under the mask of these uh, building blocks. So. For instance, if I were to right click on a block and I would go to mask and say, look under mask, we can see how that block was built up. As you can see, it's a behavioral charge pump. It's not a transistor level, circuit level charge pump. And what we're doing in here is, again, we're capturing the behavior. We're capturing things like the threshold behavior on the input, the threshold voltage. Uh, we're capturing some timing impairments and that's via the up and down impairment subsystem and then we're modeling the up and down currents as well as some leakage current so we've got a number of different impairments and features of the charge pump included here so if we go back to the top of the block what we what we did was when we enabled impairments was we said let's have a, a current imbalance of 10 microamps and a leakage current of a tenth of a microamp. And so now if we go underneath, how does that manifest itself? Well, I'm going to hit control U this time as the shortcut for looking under the mask. And if we go here, we're going to see that we've got not just a perfect five milliamps on the up and down current, but there is some amount of deviation from that. Again, going back to the top again, we've got some amount of imbalance, current imbalance. And that's what we see on those two gain blocks. Here, we see that imbalance results in not 5 milliamps, but 5 milliamps and about, what is that, 5 microamps, and then our plus 5 microamps and minus about 5 uh, microamps from that. And then you see here with the leakage current, we've got that tenth of a microamp bias or offset leakage current here. And that's going to end up adding that, again, that spurious effect or that steady state um, uh, 30 megahertz effect that's being, that's feeding through the system. Now, of course, we're not limited to the current impairments. We could also inject timing impairments, and that's what the middle section is for, the up and down section. So, for instance, if I go back to the top and I wanted to uh, add a timing impairment, I'll do that here. I'll enable that, 
say apply. And now what I have is a rise fall time on the up path of five nanoseconds and a rise fall time of two nanoseconds on the down path. Okay, so if I say okay here and I go underneath the hood now, now the charge pump impairment block on this variant subsystem is enabled and not just the perfect through wire as it was before. So this is, you haven't seen this before, this is called a variant subsystem and it allows you to include the uh, different behaviors under a common subsystem. So now if I look at this block and I double click on the slew rate block, we're going to see that it has a rise fall time of five nanoseconds and a certain propagation delay, certain rise fall time here, okay? So I could pull that off to the side and if we go underneath the charge pump impairment on the downside, double click on that, and we see we've got a rise fall time of two nanoseconds and a propagation delay of four nanoseconds. So I'm gonna pull that off to the side a second. And let's go actually back to that subsystem. Let's go back to, uh, let's go here. Okay, and again, going back to our custom impairment modeling, going under the charge pump, um, we've got now the timing impairments enabled. And remember on the upside, on the upside of the charge pump, we have a five nanosecond rise time, rise fall time, and a two nanosecond fall time. Let's just concentrate, um, yeah, five, five and two respectively. And so let's just remember those numbers, five up, two down. If we go underneath the mask again, and we look at these here again, we have five on the up, and we have on the down, We have two nanoseconds on the down. So that timing mismatch again is going to lead to spurious behavior with the reference uh, feed through, re the reference frequency effect basically leaking through to the output. So let's now add that to the mix. And let's just remember where we left off before. We left off with just the current impairments and we had a peak to peak here of around 14, 15 uh, microvolts uh, with this 30 megahertz variation. Let's run it again now. Let's see what how it, if it looks any different. It looks bigger. It looks does look worse. I will hit auto scale, and we will go in and look at the steady state again. Let's auto scale vertically, and now we have uh, much more. We have peak to peak. We've got 188 uh, peak to peak for the uh, variation, and again around. 30 megahertz here again we, that's what we would expect for the reference frequency so that definitely had a significant impact um, on the output and yet again in this model i am not yet looking at the output in the frequency domain we will get into a spectrum analysis of the output or individual signals in uh, follow-on videos so for right now i'm just doing everything nice and simple uh, in the time domain all right the one more thing I do want to uh, show in this model is you're not strictly limited to the impairments which are um, that come with the tool. When you get mixed signal block set, uh, these blocks have their own built-in impairments for things like current and timing and rise time and fall times. Depending on what the block is, it'll have its own uh, relevant contextual uh, impairment. However, what if you wanted to do something beyond what the mixed signal block set provided right out of the box? Well. You can break the link on all of these blocks, actually, instead of just looking underneath via control U or look under mask, which this is what it is. But at this point, you can't actually modify. So if I'm going to try to drag this around, it'll say, well, you've attempted to modify a library block and you cannot modify it because you're locked or inside another locked link. Okay, well, it turns out there is a workaround for that. And for this case, I'm going to modify under the hood, we're going to look under the hood and modify under the hood of the phase frequency detector. So let's say we wanted to do something under here instead. I could just look underneath the hood. That's fine. Again, I can't modify. If I try to move, it's going to tell me I can't do it. Okay. So to, in order to do that, I've got to break the link to the library. And to do that, I'm going to go back to my MATLAB. I, I have to have a shortcut just to do that because I do it so often and you could save a shortcut yourself or just type it. It's called set param, get current block, GCB, link status, none. 
So I'm just going to type. If I just click that block, that's now it's my current block. And if I say set param GCV link status, none. So now it's no longer linked to a library. Now you notice it added a down arrow to the lower left-hand corner. I can click on that and now look underneath as opposed to hitting control U. And now I can do things like drag that block and move it. And it doesn't complain. It doesn't say it's part of a locked library. Now, beyond just uh, now viewability or dragability and being able to do things like, you know, add a game block, you know, put something in here like this. Beyond just that, I can also structurally change things, uh, break lines and, and um, just make modifications. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to take these blocks, drag them over. I'm going to give myself some extra space to operate. And what I want to do is add a delay asymmetry to my phase frequency detector. And I'm going to do that right here. To do that, I'm going to pull in a something called a variable time delay or a variable pulse delay. They're very, very similar operations. And I'm going to say the reset path delay on this path is some minimal value, like 30 picoseconds. But the, re, but the delay on this bottom path, it may be a little greater. It's mismatched. So I'm going to do something like this, and I'm going to feed that back into here. And the delay, I'm going to set it in this port right here. And so for now, I'm just going to make it a constant delay, but it could, of course, be a time varying signal. No problem there. And I'm going to say it's, well, uh, you know, what is it going to have? 10 picoseconds, whatever, something like that. So now there's 10 picoseconds of extra added delay on the down reset path of this flip-flop as compared to the upper flip-flop. Now I also, I, for now, I want to isolate this effect. And I don't want to add it onto the impairment that I've already added to the charge pump because then I won't know like incrementally what the incremental contribution from the base frequency detector is. So to really isolate the impact, I'm just going to enable one impairment at a time, namely on the base frequency detector. So let's run this again and let's see what happens with 10 picoseconds of delay asymmetry on the phase frequency detector. And we can see its effect right here. We, and we can also see as a quick glance here, looking in steady state, that the look and feel of the impairment is a little different. We see it has more dynamic up and down. It's not just a constant ramp type of or semi sinusoidal waveform. It's got some up and down to it. It's not as clean a waveform, but yet still, it's actually, in this case, even, uh, let's just see here. Is the frequency the same? Uh, I was expecting, let's see, let's go here, here, here. Uh, the frequency is, looks like a little different. Let's go there. Let's auto scale it. And it looks like we're getting a somewhat lower frequency in this case, the dominant frequency. I'm not sure if I can trust it here because we're not necessarily getting reliable zero crossings, and that may lead to erroneous frequency measurements. So in this case, let's take the frequency measurement via manual means. Um, and, and let's do that by enabling cursor measurements. And what I'm going to do now is pick a con at some point here, like maybe at the trough of that waveform. And I could pick it at the bottom of this waveform. And if we go down, scroll down a little bit here, it's going to say delta T is this, and 1 over delta T is about 7.5 megahertz. So you can see we're getting a um, some different frequency content here. That would be about 1, what is that, 1 fourth of 30 megahertz. Now, we could also do things like um, uh, measure and see if there's different you know, components besides just that one. We could go maybe to that little point and that little point. And this number, let's see, if we look at those, that is around 30 megahertz. So the spacing between these little spikes is around 30 megahertz. Uh, but this other effect is around 7.5. So there's different frequencies at play here. Again, if we, if, we, if we go to that spike and we go to that little trough, we're getting, what is that, around 30 megahertz? Yeah. And if we go over to here to this one, Again, we're getting around 30 megahertz or so. I'm looking at that one over delta T value there. So indeed, it is related, again, to the reference frequency. And again, if we did look at this on the spectrum analyzer output, we would see um, 
spurious component at uh, 30 megahertz offset as well as maybe 7.5 removed from the carrier at 2.1 gigahertz okay so again in review what we've done is we've taken the pll that we built up in section two we've shown how to look under the hood look under the mask of these blocks show how the impairments are actually enabled um, and how these charge pump and and a phase frequency detector were modeled behaviorally not so much at a, a lower circuit level and how you could um, add your own impairments uh, to do the blocks okay and that is about it's about as straightforward as that the variable pulse delay lock i didn't point it out but it is part of the mixed signal block set you just put a time variant or static delay input and then it delays the input to the output by that amount there is also a similar block in the uh, base simulink library called the variable time delay it models time delay using a different scheme however it essentially is accomplishing the same sort of effect uh, this one i would say does so in a more efficient manner computationally uh, this one is using more math under the hood this is using more of a scheduled time delay taking advantage of the uh, simulink engine to do the delay so it's very analogous to the uh, hash uh, symbol in verilog uh, for implementing the delay in uh, simulink they are both however work with both continuous and discrete time signals so you're not limited to just one or the other okay i think i'll leave it at there in the next video we'll get into more impairment modeling and more measurements um, and from the subject of mixed signal block set and PLL modeling.